Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Eagle Territory. My name is Jared and I will be your presenter today as we go on an amazing adventure today about what it's like for a bald eagle story to begin. We all know that eagle stories, especially at the National Eagle Center, typically people like to think they begin with our avian ambassadors, our team of ambassador eagles. But their stories did not start at the National Eagle Center. They started in one particular place. All eagle stories began right here, right at their big, beautiful eggs. And here in the River Valley and along the Mississippi River, bald eagles in Wabasha typically start laying their eggs around end of February or so. So if you're around end of February, early March, you can start to see eagles laying their eggs and start to be very nesty around their territories. Well, the egg for bald eagles is where their story begins. Big, beautiful, white eggs. And even though their stories begin at their eggs, Back after World War II, it was also the start of the end of their story as well. Sadly, following World War II, a pesticide was being used. A pesticide that had one job, kill bugs. And granted, it was good at it, but it had unforeseen consequences on our natural world. Now, if you're thinking, I know what that chemical is, and you're right, it had three letters. It was DDT, that one chemical that everyone knows, and it was made to do one thing, kill bugs. In fact, magazines endorsed it. This is an actual ad from Time Magazine. And look at what it says, DDT is good for me. And it was true, it didn't harm people. We didn't know what it did to anything but bugs. We know it killed bugs and we sprayed it everywhere. If you're at a local beach, it would get fogged. We sprayed it everywhere. And that's for general people use. We don't like bugs being around us when we're at the beach, so we just spray it. But what if you were a farmer? Well, you'd get a local pilot to crop dust your fields. You were, we sprayed it everywhere. And believe it or not, it was used on planes. Let's say a mosquito ended up on board with you when you were boarding. Well, you just had the local stewardess spray that mosquito with some DDT. You're good to go. You were able to enjoy your flight in peace. Even if you were swimming at the local swimming pool, you just got the lifeguard to spray the horse fly that was buzzing your head. We use this chemical everywhere for the one purpose of killing bugs, keeping our crops safe, keeping us safe. We put so much of this chemical in the landscape, it didn't stay where we wanted it to. It ended up moving. And where it moved to is primarily the big waterways, like the Mississippi River. Well, when that chemical was put on a farmer's field, let's say that, and a local rain came through and washed that DDT into the river, it ended up getting absorbed. It got absorbed by the aquatic plants. The aquatic plants would absorb that DDT while they were absorbing other chemicals as well, kind of just keeping their own life going. Well, the DDT got stored in the aquatic plants, and from there, it got passed up the food chain. Well, who it went to next was the adorable little fish. Little fish love eating aquatic plants, so this little bluegill pictured here would swim along, eat the aquatic plant, end up getting some of that DDT in the little fish as well, and then it got stuck there. Well, it kept moving because you know who eats the little fish? The bigger fish. The great big northern pike would eat the little fish, end up eating that DDT, and it got stuck there at the big fish as well. Well, our big fish would be sitting in the backwaters of the Mississippi River, and up above him, perched in a tree, is everyone's favorite master predator. It would be the big bad bald eagle would end up eating that big fish and eating that DDT as well. But that's where it stopped. It stopped at the bald eagle. This travel up the food chain is known as biomagnification. It would start at the aquatic plants in very low levels, and every time it went up the food chain, it got greater concentration until it got stuck at the eagle. Well, that's pretty hard to visualize, so let's take a walk through it. This cone represents a particle of DDT that got washed into the river, and it got absorbed by our aquatic plant. Just one particle. But then, a bunch of aquatic plants absorbed a bunch of particles of DDT. Just bunches of them. Well, as it got eaten by the small fish, those particles of DDT got stuck in one spot. And then when the small fish got eaten by, let's say, the big northern pike, even more particles of DDT got stacked up. And then when that big fish got eaten by the eagle, who eats lots of big fish, a bunch of DDT ended up stuck at the eagle. And well, when that happens, it gets biomagnified into one giant DDT particle for expression's sake. 
and then it got stuck in the eagle and it didn't go anywhere. Eagles are top level predators. No one messes with them. No other predator eats them. So bald eagles would end up stuck with DDT and that's where the problem started to occur. Bald eagles were discovered to being infected by DDT through the process of eggshell thinning syndrome. The bodies of bald eagles would mistake DDT for calcium. Where do we as humans put our calcium? In our bones, helps them be big and strong, right? Well, bald eagles put their calcium in their bones as well, they also put it in their eggs. And that's the issue. Instead of putting calcium in their eggs, the bald eagles were putting DDT into their eggs. Basically no calcium. And the eggs were coming out weird and misshapen and thin. And when the bald eagle went to sit on their eggs, they would squish them, breaking their eggs. And then you had this horrific effect of the mature bald eagles dying on the landscape of natural causes, but no young eagles were being hatched, no eaglets. So you weren't having any adults replacing themselves in the population. Well, thankfully in 1972, DDT was banned. It was taken out of the landscape in North America. Well, in 1973, bald eagles were put on what we now know as the endangered species list. They were at critical levels. They were close to extinction. In fact, I'm pretty sure most of the adults watching this right now are shaking their heads. They know what I'm talking about. It was rare to see a bald eagle. You were certain these birds were gonna go extinct and young kids today were gonna learn about them in the history books, not in person like they can at the National Eagle Center. Well, thankfully we cared about our eagles and in 2007, the bald eagle came off the endangered species list and their population has been growing ever since. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but we need to learn from history. So today, we are going to figure out, well, how much weight can an egg hold? Now granted, I am not going to take a bald eagle egg, a very, very large egg. Instead, I'm going to take a chicken egg. A teeny tiny little white chicken egg. Oddly enough, don't they look similar? Bald eagle eggs much bigger than a tiny chicken egg. We are gonna take this real chicken egg and we are gonna put it into our makeshift nest. Now this egg shell or egg breaking contraption as we call it here, simulates an eagle nest. We have our female bald eagle, but we gotta put the egg in it. So we take our egg and we put it inside our nest, our nice safe nest. Now as it sits right now, there are six pounds of weight sitting on that nest. We are gonna take our eagle, put it on top, and we have now the weight of a Floridian male bald eagle sitting on that egg. Why is that important? It's because as you head farther south in an animal's range, their bodies get smaller. We're not talking about male bald eagles from Florida. In eagles, the girls are bigger. We're talking about a proud Minnesotan female bald eagle. And to get to her weight, we need to add an additional six pounds of weight. Another six pounds right here going up on top. There are now 12 pounds sitting on that egg. Now don't worry, it may be a little tipped off to the side, but we're gonna get the weight put back on top. Six pounds of weight, not too bad, so 12 total. Let's add another, let's say seven pounds to it, bringing our total up to 19. Here we go, 19 pounds. That egg is still holding strong. We're over the weight of a female bald eagle. Let's add another eight pounds, just for the fun of it. Let's bring that total up to 27 pounds of weight. That is a hefty amount of weight. That egg is holding twice the weight of a female bald eagle in this area. Remember, that's a chicken egg. So let's add an additional nine pounds of weight, bringing that total up to 36 pounds. That egg is still going strong. That is very incredible. Now that's just generic weight. Let's add the weight of some birds we see around this area. First off is the adorable turkey vulture. People love turkey vultures even if they don't want to admit it. Turkey vultures are nature's garbage men. They clean up after roadkill. They're experts at it. So let's add four pounds worth of turkey vulture. That is now 40 pounds of weight sitting on that real chicken egg. So let's keep going. We want to make that egg break. Let's see what its breaking point is. Let's add a rare frequent, a rare visitor to Minnesota, the snowy owl. A gorgeous bird, snowy owls are Minnesota's heaviest non-breeding species of owl. And they're a winter migrant to this area. So let's add four pounds worth of snowy owl, bringing our total to 44 pounds of weight. 
That egg is still holding strong, isn't it? Well, we're going to keep going because it's no fun to stop there. Let's add an owl you may have heard but not seen. The great horned owl, Minnesota's tiger of the night, if you will. These birds will take on anything. They're master predators. During the day, eagles are top dog. At night, great horned owls take that role. And this is three and a half pounds worth of great horn. We are up to 47.5 pounds of weight. That is incredible. That egg is still going strong. Let's add a bird who bald eagles love, but the feeling is not mutual. The osprey. A single osprey in this area tops out at about three pounds, but why do eagles love them? It's because osprey are better at fishing than bald eagles. A bald eagle is only successful fishing about 30% of the time. That's a terrible catch rate but an osprey is successful almost 80% of the time. So why not let your neighbor, the osprey, do all the hard work and then the eagle can go steal it from them. Bald eagles are notorious thieving birds. They'll steal food and well, might as well let your neighbor, the osprey, do all the hard work. This is a nice three pound osprey, bringing our total up to 50 and a half pounds. Wow, that egg is still going strong. So let's add some more weight to it. We're not done yet. Let's add a local red tail. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen a red tailed hawk in your neighborhood, and you should be thankful for it. A single red tailed hawk can kill over a thousand mice in one year. One of the best flying mouse traps known to nature. Well, this big two and a half pound red tail is going to bring our total up to 53 pounds. And it's still stacked up. It's still going strong. That egg is incredible, isn't it? And remember, that's a chicken egg. Much smaller than a bald eagle egg. And yet it's holding a dramatic amount of weight. We still have a few birds left. Let's add the world's fastest animal, a peregrine falcon at about a pound and a half, diving at over 200 miles an hour to bring our total up to 54 and a half pounds. Oop, don't want to lose our tower. Hey, there we go, 54 and a half pounds. That is a lot of weight. And that shows chicken eggs are tough. And yet, to get back to our story, bald eagles were crushing their own eggs under their own 12 pound body weight. That is a tragedy. But thankful, we humans fixed that problem. We removed DDT from the landscape, gave bald eagles a chance to right their population, and now they're back in record numbers. The, the purpose of this little experiment is to show that, yes, we humans can devastate a landscape, but we can also fix it. Hope is not lost. We can educate younger generations, like what we do here at the National Eagle Center, to care about our ambassadors, to care about our natural world, and we can live in harmony with these other master predators. We're top of the food chain, but other predators hold that as well. I want to thank you all so much for joining me today for an Adventures in Eagle Territory. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope to catch you next time at the National Eagle Center. Thank you so much.